you have your Bibles, please turn with me to John chapter 4. Let me pray for us as we get started. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to listen like one being taught. The Lord God has opened my ear, and I was not disobedient, nor did I turn back. Amen. Well, we've already read the passage in our responsive reading, so I won't do that again right now. Jesus is in the middle of a conversation with the woman at the well, and the topic of worship comes up. The woman is desirous of worshiping God correctly. She's had her sin exposed to her, and in the midst of perceiving Christ to be a prophet, she wants to get her life right with God. And the question that comes to her mind is, where do I go to do that? As a Samaritan, she has worshipped God on Mount Gerizim. And as a Jew, they worshipped God in Jerusalem. And because she wants to get right with God... She seeks an answer as to which is the proper place. Now, what we're going to do this morning is begin to look at the real heart of this passage. What we've seen so far is really a prologue to this, but now we want to start to look at the heart of the text. Jesus says in verse 21 that the time is coming when it won't be Mount Gerizim, And it won't be at Jerusalem. And we've already talked, at least to some extent, about the abolishing of the ceremonial system and so forth. But in verse 22, our Lord becomes very specific in defining the nature of true worship. And that's what we want to begin to look at this morning, the nature of worship, the essence of worship, what worship really is at its heart. William Temple, and actually one of the church members had given me this quote last week. He was the former bishop of Manchester, and years ago he defined worship this way. To worship is to quicken the conscience by the holiness of God, to feed the mind with the truth of God, to purge the imagination by the beauty of God, to open the heart to the love of God, and to devote the will to the purpose of God. It's all of us, or all in us, giving Everything in response to all of him. It's all that we are. Reacting rightly to all that he is. Now we've also talked about the importance of worship. And as the song we just sang and as our text says, we've seen that the Father seeks true worshipers. He seeks them. That makes it important, right? That's the end of God's redemptive purpose. We are saved to worship God. And worship is not something that we receive. It's something that we come to give. And that's important. Evelyn Underhill, writing in 1928 to a conference of clergy in the Church of England, said this, We are drifting toward a religion which consciously or unconsciously keeps its eye on humanity rather than deity. Now, if that was true in 1928, how true is it today in 2022? Even the evangelical church finds herself prone to be man-centered. We talk about our problems 
our programs, our efforts, our methods, our sermons, our music, our books, and so forth. And in all of this, it's easy to lose sight of the fact that we should be far more conscious of God than ourselves in worship. We've also talked about the source of worship. And we said that the source of worship is salvation. Verse 23 in our text tells us that God seeks worshipers. And so when someone becomes a Christian, they become a true worshiper. As one writer put it, you awaken from your moral slumber in the morning of your regeneration to begin to worship God. We've also talked about the object of worship, the fact that when we come together, we focus on God and Him alone. He is to be worshiped in spirit and as a spirit and as the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We worship Him in His Trinitarian fullness. See, and we shouldn't evaluate worship on the basis of what it does for us. We shouldn't come here on the Lord's Day even primarily uh, to get a blessing or to receive something. We don't come primarily asking, how is this going to lift me up? How is this going to benefit me, uh, make me feel good, and so forth? We should come to give to God, to worship Him. He's the object of our worship. Now, we've also talked about the sphere of worship. The sphere of worship, Jesus indicated, is not Mount Gerizim. It's not Jerusalem. And then he says in verse 24, God is a spirit. Therefore, the sphere of worship is not restricted to any location. See, but it's to be done everywhere at all times. Now, there is today still a temple where God meets his people, and that's right here. It's the corporate assembly of his people. We, the body of Christ, are now the temple of God. So while we worship God at all times and in all places, there is still the uniqueness of the Lord's Day. Right, the uniqueness of our corporate gathering and coming together as the living stones, as Peter talks about in corporate worship, to be in the habitation of the Spirit of God. That's why Paul said in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty, they met together in one place. See, we need to worship God everywhere at all times, but also together in the assembly of his people. Now, today then, we want to begin to look at the nature of worship. And it's simply stated in our passage. Look at verse 22. Jesus says to the Samaritan woman, You worship that which you do not know. Now, what does he mean by that? Well, first of all, he's acknowledging that she worships, right? He says, you worship, you just don't know what you're worshiping. And that was characteristic of the Samaritans. Why? Well, because they only accepted the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. They didn't acknowledge the rest of the Bible, and so their knowledge was limited. And Jesus says to this woman, you don't know what you worship. They had the Pentateuch, and that told them some things, important things about God, but not enough to have full salvation revelation. So they didn't really know the fullness of what they were worshiping. And what we have with the Samaritans was enthusiastic worship, but without proper knowledge, without proper information. 
So we could say, to use Jesus' terms here, they worshiped in spirit. You know, they were into it, <clears throat> but they didn't have the right information. You know, what's interesting is recently as 1982, you could still find them slicing up animals on Mount Gerizim. They were still at it, still operating under the Mosaic legislation. They didn't consider the other 61 books of the Bible. Now, they had enough information to know about the Messiah because he appears in the book of Genesis. Uh, they also believed in a literal, physical, bodily resurrection in the future. They got that out of the Hebrew text in Deuteronomy. So they had some information. It just wasn't enough. And Jesus says to her, you worship in spirit, see, but you lack truth. Look back at verse 22. Jesus says, we worship that which we know. For salvation is from the Jews. See, the Jews had the very opposite situation. They accepted all of the Old Testament. They had the truth, but they lacked the spirit of worship. You remember in Matthew chapter 6, it says that the Pharisees prayed and fasted and gave alms and all those things, but their hearts weren't there. Their hearts weren't in it, and Jesus calls them what? Phonies, hypocrites. There were some Jews who were zealous, but for most of them, worship was truth based on the Bible, but their hearts were empty. So the Lord says Jerusalem has the truth, but not the spirit. Gerizim has the spirit, but not the truth. And if you think about it, here we see the two poles, don't we, of worship. On the one hand, you have Jerusalem, which is barren, lifeless orthodoxy. On the other hand, you have Gerizim, which is enthusiastic heresy. And that's what Jesus sees as he talks to the Samaritan woman. And it's what we can still see in the church today in some places. The same two extremes. On the one hand, you've got very enthusiastic people. And on the other hand, barren orthodoxy. People who are meticulous about the truth, they just can't get excited about it. And think of your circles, you know, your upbringing. Think of our circles today. We have to guard against this. People get bored after 30 minutes. We've got the content, but we don't know how to turn our hearts loose sometimes. Those are the two poles. And Jesus says to this woman, look, the hour is coming when the true worshipers, see, are going to worship God in both ways, in spirit and in truth, with the truth and with the heart. That's what the Father seeks. That's what he is after. Both truth and the Spirit must be there. The two enemies of biblical worship are Jerusalem and Gerizim. Sincerity is great. Enthusiasm is great. Aggressive worship is great, but it has to be based on the truth. And on the other hand, truth is great, <clears throat> but if it doesn't issue an eager, anxious, thrilled heart, then it can be lacking. And I think if we have a tendency in our circles, perhaps it's the latter. We can be formal in our worship style, but we have to be careful not to slip into formalism. Enthusiasm and formality of worship style 
don't have to be mutually exclusive. They shouldn't be, if you think about it. There's no reason for it. Think of the hymns that we sing. They're so rich in content. The creeds we recite are rich in content, but we should sing them and recite them vigorously, vigorously. Jesus tells the Samaritan woman that the Father seeks both. Al Martin, a retired Baptist Reformed pastor, said this, Men have worshipped with open Bibles and with the name of Christ and the Bible on their lips, while whole congregations before them have been held in the grip of barrenness and lifelessness and powerlessness, where it has been weeks and months and years since hearts have been ravished with the sight of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Years since any hymn has been sung with abandonment. Years since a tear has trickled down the face of a worshiper. Years since a hallelujah flowed out of a bursting heart. You know, we read about people in the Bible, right? The Old Testament. Think of David. Think of the prophets who danced before the Lord. And we look at that and we say, you know, that was then. That was a different era. We don't do things the way that they did them then. Or we can look at something like, say, the modern day charismatic movement. And we view them as extreme. But you know what? Maybe we need to learn something from them. We may not agree with all of their theology, but one thing they have is the practice and an ability and the enthusiasm to see God and to worship Him in every event of life. They're always talking about God, right? They see God in everything. The washing machine breaks at home, what do they do? They go lay hands on it and they pray and things like that. Now, that may be a little extreme to us, but the lesson is there. They're always enthusiastic. They see God in everything. And I think that's a positive thing that the modern day church can glean from a movement like that. I'm not sure which is worse. See, we point at them, we say bad theology. And they point at us and they say dead orthodoxy. What does Jesus say? The Father seeks those who worship in spirit and truth. Thomas Watson, I close with this, the great Puritan writer, he said this concerning being asleep during worship. Take heed of drowsiness in hearing, and maybe we could add to that in singing, Drowsiness shows much irreverence. How lively are many when they are about the world, but in the worship of God, how drowsy. The Father seeks those who will worship in spirit and in truth. May he give us grace to be those kind of people. Let's pray together. As our hearts are bowed, if you're listening to this, and we can't become true worshipers until we're first reconciled with God. The Bible tells us that when we come into the world, we're not reconciled to Him, we're at enmity with Him because we come into the world sinful and separated from Him. And that shows up in our lives in different ways. Often it shows up just in living a life independently of Him. We still may be good people, we still may do good things in the world, but we're the ones calling the shots. We're disinterested, we're not doing things according to God's Word and the way He wants us to do them. The Bible calls that sin. And if we live our entire lives that way, when we die, we spend eternity 
separated from it. But he has given a way to change that. He sent his son to come, the only one who ever lived a perfect life of obedience to God's will, because none of us can do that. But not only did he do that, he also went to the cross and he took on himself the penalty that you and I deserve. Now, we may know that. We may agree with all of that. But that still doesn't help us unless we do something about it. What do we have to do about it? Well, we have to come to Christ personally. It's not anything that going to church necessarily does. It's not anything that... Growing up believing certain facts about Christ or God does, we have to come to that place where we personally, as an act of the will, turn to Jesus Christ, invite Him into our lives, and then turn our lives over to Him. Have you done that? Have you truly done that, genuinely done that? If not, you can do it right now. Pray silently in your heart like this. Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for me. I want my life to be pleasing to God. And I know it hasn't been. I know I'm a sinner. Thank you that you died for my sins. Right now, come into my heart. Cleanse me. Give me the gift of eternal life. And from this day forward, make me the kind of person that you want me to be. Amen.